Last week, we talked about how people recognize objects and really how well people recognize objects, given how difficult the problem is, given how objects can be seen in all different sorts of illumination, in different positions, in different angles. And yet, we are able to extract that information. We are able to take the visual stuff out there, interpret it in a way that allows us to recognize all the different things that we can see in our environment. Today, we're going to kind of carry on looking at that. We're going to look at what's really a special class of objects. That's the human face. We're going to look at how we recognize human faces and how we do, do it quite as well as we do. We're really expert at recognizing faces. So again, we can think about how do we take that visual information and how do we transfer it into a form which allows us to put a name to a face and to do all the other clever things we can do with faces. So I'm going to start off again by just pointing out that it's a hard problem. Face recognition is a hard problem, and it's a clever thing we do. If you think about all the different types of faces you can recognize and all the different types of information you can get from the face, you kind of start to appreciate how well we can do face recognition.
Who makes these decisions? In the international arena, the decisions are made by states, but to George Orwell's phrase, some states are more equal than others. The ones who are the most equal are the ones called G7, the seven rich industrial countries, and they have an overwhelming effect on states' decisions. And of the G7, the one that's far away the most equal is, of course, the United States, which since the Second World War has had a position of overwhelming international power, you know, historical president to then, and of course has used to design a world and the interests of powerful sectors within. Alongside the powerful states, there are the institutions that have designed the international financial institutions, the IMF, from world banks. World Trade Organization took over from a gap a couple of years ago. Those are institutions of global dominant, global control, which are themselves controlled by the rich countries, primarily by the United States, which, once again, has an overwhelming influence.
the question today of you know what makes a luxury brand a luxury brand and how do we distinguish it is very hard to answer the standard business response is to say they are more exclusive and we get exclusivity by having high price and relatively small amounts of the product available the reality however of luxury brands is they're sold in their millions and in some cases are not priced that much higher than the standard output the only way i can really answer your question is to say it's all relative as you said in your introduction you know it wasn't that long ago in australia that we would have considered two televisions to be a luxury or even further back one color television uh, and you can make a strong argument for example that starbucks in china right now is a luxury purchase because of its cost because of how frequently it's purchased by many people so i think the the long answer is is, is a complicated one but but the answer is it depends who you talk to i I think in the business community what we would say is there are a a small cluster of more expensive brands which have a distinct strategy that we would identify as being luxury brands and they start with the Rolls Royces and the Tiffany's and the Louis Vuittons of the world and I think that tends to be how we see them.
Now that story has been scotched as a part of a contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? Considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Miri, something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is there a predicament something we have to face up to as a nation? For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not, they're, they're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. Lawrence Stephen Lowry RBS Raw was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his city landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits and the unpublished Naranet works, which were only found after his death. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the Central Contract Patterns Generator, CPG. This process pr produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in ways that produce running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes such as going from standstill to walking.
Two. Listen to an art instructor talk about composition. Composition is the organization of shapes and forms into a whole, an expressive whole. The elements of composition, line, shape, tone, and color, need to be well arranged. Need to be ordered. They need to be coherent, just like the words and phrases and sentences in a piece of writing. All paintings have a compositional element. Successful paintings sort of suggest the third dimension, the sense that the design goes beyond the picture frame. A picture's unity, which includes the shapes, tones, and colors, is linked to what the artist has to say. The artist's message is strongest when it's clear. A composition is better if it says one thing strongly than if it tries to say too many things. A crowded composition is sort of fussy and splintered and lacks unity. Even a painting of a single object needs thoughtful composition, so the character of the object is present in every shape. The professor is talking about economics in colonial New England. We know that in colonial New England, the Native Americans, compared to the European colonists, had a far greater knowledge of what resources in the environment could be eaten or made useful. Native Americans used a wide range of resources for economic subsistence, and these resources were simply used by the family that acquired them. Only a few resources were accumulated for the purpose of showing a person's social status. For example, shells, furs, and ornaments of the hunt.、Uh, excuse me, Doctor Singer, but did they?、Um, did the Native Americans have a concept of wealth? The Native Americans believed a person's status came more from kinship and personal alliances than from stores of wealth. Their definition of need was what they needed to survive. So, if they had food, clothing, and shelter, they considered themselves wealthy. For the European colonists, on the other hand, resources in the environment were seen more as commodities, as goods that could be exchanged in markets. European economies measured commodities in terms of money values, abstract equivalencies that could be accumulated and could function as indicators of wealth and social status. Yes, it's funny you should mention Merwin. Until about a year ago, I thought England was the only country that had a poet laureate. After all, it's a pretty odd job, isn't it? No salary to speak of, and just a barrel of wine or something as payment. <laughs> but he was, or is, the American poet laureate, isn't he? That's right. But quite a few other countries have one too. I know. I looked into it a bit. Other countries in the UK, for a start,、uh, Wales, as you'd expect, with their Eisteddfods and long poetic tradition. And Ireland and Scotland.、Mm. I think some places that were colonies or in the Commonwealth have them.、Uh, Canada, for example. And who's that wonderful Caribbean poet?、Um, the one that wrote Omeros.、Uh, Derek Walcott. That's him. He was the poet laureate of Saint Lucia. But what about the rest of Europe? Don't the French have such a thing? No, I don't think so. They've got the Academy, and you get elected to that if you're considered the best in your field.、Mm. But、uh, I think Germany might have. No, it wasn't Germany. Somewhere else, but I don't remember. By the way, you're a bit behind the times in thinking what they get paid as a barrel of wine. <laughs> All that changed long ago. But one of the more recent ones asked to have it back. <laughs> The earliest writers on politics, and I'm thinking of Plato and Aristotle here, felt free to draw insights from all areas of human knowledge. Unlike modern academic writers, who tend to put things into smaller and smaller compartments or focus more closely on one area of inquiry. For example, Plato would examine a whole political system and the philosophy that underlies it, 
whereas modern writers on politics might concentrate on one particular institution in that system, the House of Lords in England, or on voting patterns within a country. With this focus, the bigger questions that the ancients dealt with, what is the best form of government, or what is justice, tend to get left behind. Many writers on politics these days are university-based, and so have to have specialised interests. And while they may make new and interesting discoveries in their special field, it is at the loss of a broader perspective, not to mention the loss of a general audience or readership. In the 19th century, there were still writers who used the same freedom of inquiry as the ancients, and are all the more readable and relevant because of it. Scientists distinguish two basic ways in which we receive information from the outside world through the sense of touch. Active and passive, or to put it more simply, touching and being touched. Being touched, or passive tactile awareness, includes sensing external pressure and temperature acting on parts of the body, and this gives us clues as to the nature of our environment. Active touching is when we explore our surroundings with our hands, feet, mouth and so on. Because it's difficult to guess what some objects are really like with the eyes alone, for example their weight, hardness or softness, roughness or smoothness, etc., touching them gives us a much fuller understanding of the objects around us. Yet, how touch works is very complex and Recording A. We learn most about ourselves and the way we function, both physically and mentally, when things go wrong. For a long time, it was thought that the brain acted as a whole in governing the body's functions. Then, in 1861, Paul Broca, a French anatomist and anthropologist, discovered that different parts of the brain perform different functions. After carrying out a post-mortem examination on a patient who had had a severe speech impediment, he discovered, as he had expected, damage to a section of the left frontal lobe of the brain. The left side of the brain governs language ability. The patient's problem had been that he could only utter one syllable, though he fully... Long-term exposure to noise can lead to loss of hearing. The relative loudness of sounds is measured in decibels. Just to give you an idea of what this means, the sound of a whisper is 30 decibels, while a normal conversation is 60 decibels. The noise a vacuum cleaner makes is around 85 decibels. The danger zone, the risk of injury, begins at around 90 Continual exposure to sounds above 90 decibels can damage your hearing. Loud noises, especially when they come at you every day, all this noise can damage the delicate hair cells in your inner ear. Lots of everyday noises are bad for us in the long run. For example, a car horn sounds at around 100 decibels. A rock band at close range is 125 decibels. A jet engine at close range is one of the worst culprits at an ear-busting 140 decibels. 
The first thing to go is your high frequency hearing, where you detect the consonant sounds in words. That's why a person with hearing loss can hear voices, but has trouble understanding what's being said. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. This will just take a minute. Three years ago, genome pioneer Craig Venter sailed the Sargasso Sea and returned with 1,800 species of microbes, including 150 never before seen. An impressive haul, but last week scientists in New York announced that if you want to discover new and interesting bugs, you need travel no further than your own forearm. The researchers at the NYU School of Medicine identified 182 species of bacteria, including a dozen new ones, in swabs taken from the arms of six healthy volunteers. Their study marks the first full-scale expedition to catalog the biota that calls the human epidermis its home. The microbes that live in and on our bodies outnumber our own cells 10 to 1, so they're an important part of our personal ecology. And it turns out the zoo of bacteria on one person's skin is very different from the zoo on someone else's. Almost three-quarters of the species identified were unique to an individual, and only four species were found on all six subjects. For the record, the researchers took their samples from the subject's forearms because that way no one had to undress. So who knows what exotic life forms may be waiting for discovery just behind your knees. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. Companies, projects must adapt to the general data protection regulations. You must inform your professor if you are absent in your class. Our workshops are open for all students on campus. Modern computer memory is extended every year. Fast food has become very popular with many students.
Cells are the basic building blocks of all animals and plants. Students should take the training course to use the gym. All mobile devices must be switched off during the examination.